fifth Sunday of Lent as we celebrate on this March 29th, uh, this time of worship. Let's for the call to worship. The prophet asks, can our soul-weary bones live again? Oh God, you know. We ask, can we dance again after mourning, loss, and grief? Oh God, you know. The gift is sure and simple. God's breath poured out as new life for weary souls. Let us celebrate the gift of God's new life and come to worship God in laughter and dancing. Now we sing, Here I Am, O Lord. I, the Lord of sea and the sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. The night I will go, Lord. If you I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord, the snow and the rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turned away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you falling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord, of wind and of flame, I will tend the poor and lame, I will set a feast for them, my hand will save. Finest bread I will provide, till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. The night I will go. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her 
hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you were going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to waken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, and I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and 
let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us bow our heads for prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. Lord God, our rock. Our Redeemer. Amen. Between the time when I graduated from college and was scheduled to start seminary, I had the opportunity to travel to Europe. Now, while there, I ended up working on a dairy farm for about five months. The, the barn had been built in a style where the cows were not allowed free to roam. And in this barn, as long as the cows were in the barn, they were standing in their stanchions, meaning that they had collars around their necks that allowed them to stand or to lie down, but not to move from their particular spot. When I arrived to start my work, it was early spring and the grass in the pastures had not yet started to grow, so the cows were still in their stanchions. They had been there since fall. Finally, the day had come when the grass had grown enough and the pasture was suitable for the cows to be allowed out of the barn. The farmer warned me to stand back when it came time to release the cows. And as soon as a pin was pulled from the stanchion, it fell from their neck and each cow headed for the barn door. I could not help but chuckle when I saw several of the middle-aged cows kicking both hind legs in the air as if they were youngsters, celebrating their newfound freedom while heading out for the pasture. For the next several days, this scene repeated itself several times because they, every time they milked, we let them out afterwards. And I enjoyed seeing the smile and hearing the laughter of the farmer as he released the cows, as he watched their expressions of joy as they headed to the pasture. He knew each of these cows well. He knew them by name. He knew their personalities. And what a joy it was to watch the joy on his face as he watched the joy on the cows' faces. Now, since I was not used to seeing the cows contained in this way, I asked the farmer about those stanchions. And he said that when that particular barn had been built back in the 1950s, the style of thinking of containment at that day was that was it was built into that style. He said if he could redesign that barn now, he would have built it so that the cows could move freely throughout the day. But that was not the case. And as a result, the cows were confined for the better part of about five months of the year. I tell this story because I believe it has ramifications for our time. For time and time again, people have created systems, although well-meaning, that ended up binding the people and keeping them from living to their full potential. In one sense, we are now living in that time, in these weeks and in these days, when we're feeling bound up, not able to leave our homes, but only for the essential needs or for emergencies. Today, when we read that story, passage from the raising of Lazarus, what struck me in that was towards the end, in verse 44, unbind him and let him go. This command of Jesus makes me wonder two things. Who is Jesus telling me to unbind? And if I'm bound, from what do I need to be freed? For me, the answers to these two questions are closely related. For instance, when I was called to a new parish one time, that congregation was in the midst of a process of becoming open and affirming, just as Bethel has done here. I was told that for many years, that congregation was living and acting as if they were open and affirming ONA, but they were not yet bold enough to say publicly, this is who we are as a people of God. 
And at that time that I was there, they were asking themselves, is this the time when we finally step forward and say in a bold way that we will treat all people of God as children of God, as special, for this is who we are, who we are called to be? Will we proclaim freedom to those who are bound due to their sexuality? Now, that was a difficult time for that congregation. Some were not quite yet ready to proclaim freedom for those who were oppressed. They were worried what their neighbors might think. Others were more ready to do so. But some were clearly bound by their fears of what such a vote might mean for that community that they had come to know and to love. Well, the vote finally came, and the result was that the congregation decided to proclaim freedom to the captives, to follow Jesus' command to unbind the ones who were not free to live life to their fullest. But those bound by their fears remained bound, some of them, in their sense of loss. That congregation lost several families as a result of that vote. But because many in that congregation were willing to live in the Jesus command to unbind those who were bound, to proclaim freedom to the captive, since that time that congregation has grown with young families who wanted to live in a place where the gospel was lived out in that way. Like that congregation, Bethel is also called to live out that calling to free the captives. We do this in a variety of ways, some as simply as feeding the poor, welcoming the stranger. Last year, this congregation opened its doors to a program, English as a Second Language, and virtually every day of the week, at many hours throughout the day, there are many folks in this building, people of color from diverse countries who have made their way to this place in Evansville, a place they have found welcoming to start a new life, to be unbound to live. So that brings me now to the second question I ask. So if I am bound, from what do I need to be freed? And to be honest, I've asked that question a number of times throughout my ministry. Oftentimes it was worded, do I really want to do this? Several years ago, when I was first called again back to that other congregation about which I spoke, in my first week, in the first couple days that I was there, there was a woman there who was transgender, and she asked me if I would baptize her. Now, there were many reasons not to baptize her, but there was a reason to baptize her, for she was and is a child of God. When she first asked me, my first thought was, I've only been here several days. This could cost me my job. But then my second thought was, as a minister of the gospel, I'm not only called to proclaim freedom to the captives, I'm called to share God's grace with all people, no exceptions. The night before the baptism, two key members warned me about the possible ramifications. I was well aware of the ramifications of, that, of, the, of the possibilities of which they spoke. I knew this could cost me my job in that parish. The next morning, the baptism happened. They applauded, and the baptism was over. What a welcome it was for that woman. For many in that congregation to say, we're in this with you. You are a child of God. At that moment, I knew that that community of faith was a place that I could call home for they lived out what it meant to be a beloved community. On that particular Sunday, they gave me permission to be freed from my fears that had bound me for several decades. You see, for several decades, I had hid that part of me that was called to welcome others without exception. I was fearful of what others would think. I was fearful that I would lose my job and therefore my ability to feed my family, to raise my two sons. 
in a good place. But on that weekend, in a metaphorical way, that congregation unwrapped the claws that had bound me, that had kept me from becoming that person that God intended for me to be. I was Lazarus, and they had freed me. On that day, like the cows headed for the pasture, I jumped for joy. I've been jumping ever since. May we as a beloved community continue to answer God's and Jesus' command to us, unbind those around us. May we be unbound ourselves. Wouldn't it be a sight to see all of God's children kicking their heels in the air in joy over newfound freedom and being able to live as God intended? Amen. Let us sing now our next song, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Did that grace appear the hour I first believed? Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. We turn now to a time of prayer. Of course, we want to keep in our prayer all those who have become ill with this virus. A special prayer for those who are working in the front lines, the medical workers, those doing testing. A prayer is brought to all. Let us pray. For those whose lives are broken by distress, may the God of healing restore you. For those whose lives are broken by fear, May the God of healing restore you. For those whose lives are broken by anger, may the God of healing restore you. For those whose lives are broken by pain, may the God of healing restore you. For those whose lives are broken by illness, may the God of healing restore you. Those whose lives are broken by sin, may the God of healing restore you. And God of healing, gently touch these lives with your spirit. Bring warmth and comfort, life and wholeness, restoration into fractured lives and souls. Let us remain silent for a moment. Now let us join together in the prayer that our Father, prayer of our Father, our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be done, done 
on, on earth, earth as, it is as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now a closing song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on. To the light, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows dear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear me cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall, take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. When the shadows appear and the night draws near and the way is past and gone. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. And now we close. Come out, Jesus commands, and calls us from the tombs of our existence into the brightness of a new day. Come out, Jesus cries and unbinds us from the chains of our past. Come out, Jesus calls and entices us into a world filled with grace and possibility. So go out into a world that needs our life, our breath, our spirit. Go out into a world that needs the Spirit of God carried on our lips in our loving arms. Go out into a world to live as God's resurrected people. Go out and go on the breath of God's holy wind. This service has ended. Your service now begins. Go with the breath of God. Amen.